Good morning, everyone. It's great to be worshiping with you all this morning, both those of you who are gathered here in the sanctuary and those of you who are worshiping with us at home. I'm going to start with a, a brief reading from Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us, that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you rule the peoples justly and guide the nations of the earth. And I love this psalm because it, it sort of splits things up, as we so often see in Scripture, from, from between God's work and then our response. Right? God's, God is gracious to us. God blesses us. God makes his face shine upon us in all kinds of ways. God makes his ways known. We're going to be talking a little bit later about how Jesus reveals um, God's ways to us, how, how God makes his ways known through Jesus in the fullest sense and the uh, we, we see the fullness of his grace. We see the fullness of his mercy, the fullness of his truth. Uh, and, and, and that's how God works. God reveals himself to us in all kinds of ways. He makes his face shine upon us. And then we respond. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. Uh, when it says the peoples, that's us. It's us, but it's also countless peoples around the world, right? Countless groups of people, countless uh, communities of faith here in Irwin, here in Tennessee, here in the United States, and, and around the world who are gathering this morning, throughout today, um, and they're praising God for what he has done. They're lifting up the name of God uh, in joy, in faithfulness, in, in love, because God has been faithful, because God has poured out his love uh, into our lives, into this world. And so that's why we come here today. We come because God has been gracious to us. We come because God has shown us his love and his mercy and his truth. And we come to respond to that with songs of joy, lifting up our hearts in, in a spirit of thanksgiving and, and joining our voices to the voices of, of millions, even billions of people around the world who, who will be doing the same. And so as we worship together, let's give thanks that we're a part of this song that has been going up through the generations and this, this song of thanksgiving, this song of joy that continues to, to rise up to God today. So stand and, and worship with us.
the world but it couldn't fill me and man's empty praise the treasures that fade are never enough and you came along and put me back together
This morning's scripture comes from Colossians chapter 1. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. You may be seated. to see you, I want to see you, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see
join me in prayer. God, you are holy, as we just sang, and it means there's no one like you. And all throughout scripture, all throughout the life of Jesus, in whom you were most clearly revealed to us, we see how different you are from the people around us, how different you are from, from ourselves, uh, from our hearts, and the way we think about things, the way we treat people, the way we love. Uh, we come before you in, in times of worship to proclaim that, to proclaim how different you are and, and how, how great you are when we say words like holy and we repeat them over and over again. We're, we're thinking about your greatness. But God, we also know that, that you in your holiness are, are someone that can respond to our needs in a unique way that no one else can. And especially when we face difficulties and challenges in our lives, uh, we know that you are the one we can turn to and, and hope for something real to happen. Uh, hope for uh, our prayers to be answered in ways that requests to others can never happen. And so we come to you in faith to, to lift up to you uh, the needs of many that we know among our congregation, in our community, and in the world around us. Uh, we lift up to you specifically uh, some families in our church that are, are going through some challenging times right now. Uh, we pray for the Garland family, for, for Kim Garland in particular, and some of her uh, health concerns, as well as those of, of Braden, uh, ongoing things that, that she's facing and dealing with. We pray for, for Lake and Richardson and for Paisley. And... Uh, some injuries that they're both recovering from right now that, that you would grant their families some healing and some peace in what's been kind of a chaotic time for them lately. Uh, we pray for uh, the Edwards family, for uh, Gus Edwards' sister, and ongoing uh, needs that she has and, and testing uh, that, that they're facing and, and, uh, and different things that, that they're struggling with right now. So we, we pray for Rebecca Freeman and, and her family and uh, the things that, that they're going through at the moment. Uh, we pray for Janie Arrowwood. She uh, is thankfully back home, and but still has some recovery uh, to, to go through, and we pray that you would be with her through that, help her through that time. Uh, we continue to pray for Donna Gardner and her ongoing recovery from some recent health concerns. And we pray as well for, for John and Lisa Kaiser and, and some of their friends and family members uh, that they've asked us to pray for that are, are going through some difficult uh, challenges as well uh, with, with their health and, and uh, we just continue to lift them up as well as many others that we've, we've listed on our prayer list and, and those that, that continue to uh, just find strength for each day uh, and, and try to make it through another day and another week with faithfulness, uh, with love and joy in their heart and how they live even though their circumstances aren't always easy. And God, we, we bring these things to you, not just as a, you know empty acknowledgement, but because we know the kind of God that you are, the kinds of things that you can do that the world doesn't always expect to happen uh, if they don't know who you are and what you're capable of. So we bring these things to you in faith, knowing that, that you see the bigger picture. You, you know what's right. You know what's possible um, in ways that we don't. And we, we trust and put our faith in, in your wisdom and, and whatever it is uh, that is your will in these circumstances, uh, even though we have our own hopes and desires for each of these things. But God, beyond just uh, the request for, for help, the request for needs that we have, we look around and we look in our lives, um, we have a lot of thankfulness as well for what you've done for us, for the people that you've put into our lives, for the relationships that we have, for the opportunity that we have to show love to one another and support one another. Uh, among our family, among our friends, among this congregation and community. And we ask you to open our eyes to those opportunities that you're calling us to, to show love to other people, to, to serve them, to bring joy into their lives in some way, uh, to share the good news with them, 
so that their lives might be changed as ours have been changed by the good news of Jesus. And as we think about all of these things and, and we continue in our time of worship here today, we pray that in all of it, your, your name and your glory and your holiness is made known to all who are around us. May we continue to, to keep that the focus of our time together, to take encouragement from that, and to continue to turn to you as we have need and as we have opportunities to praise you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Unless a grain of wheat shall fall upon the ground and die, it remains but a single grain with no life. This was the chorus of a communion hymn sung in my church often as I was growing up. You're welcome for not singing it right now. I didn't realize it as a child, but it is also the words of Jesus spoken in John 12, verse 24. As with many hymns I sung growing up, I learned this scripture in song form long before I was able to recognize it as a direct quote of Christ himself. Before this realization, I assumed we sang a song about wheat at communion because we were about to eat bread. It seemed like a reasonable explanation, but like many of Jesus' followers, both then and now, I didn't understand Jesus' analogy at first. Learning this verse later in its true context of Jesus predicting his death, the line made more sense. Jesus died so that we could have life, but more than that, we cannot have the life he promises at all without his death. And while Jesus' primary intention of this sentence about wheat grain was to describe the reason for his impending death in a way that his followers would understand, the next few verses, as well as several other verses in scripture, give us cause to believe he was also suggesting that we must also die to have life. Verses 25 and 26 of that passage say, the man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. First Peter says, we are to die to sin. Colossians says, you have died, and in your life is hit, and your life is hidden in Christ. Jesus tells us, us to take up our cross in more than one gospel. And Romans says we are to die with Christ, that we are crucified with him, and that we have been baptized into his death. Indeed, most of us know that our baptism is a sign of this dying to our old self and emerging anew. But we are also keenly aware of our continuous failure to live sinless, even after our baptism and our proclamation of salvation in Christ. Even with the help of the Holy Spirit, we still fail daily. The celebration of communion serves as our weekly reminder of our death and life found in Christ, a reminder that we desperately need. We remember his death, and so we remember our own, and we are called into deeper holiness. The communion hymn about the death of wheat seeds is intended to help us bring to mind this remembrance of him. And so today we take communion together. As we take communion together, let us remember our undeniable need for his death, his mercy, and his grace. Let us remember and renew our own death with Christ that we may produce seeds that bear fruit to bring him glory.
Pray for the Lord's Supper. Loving Father, Lord, Lord, we thank you for the this special time in our service. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to be sustained. Lord, you are a sustaining God. You give what we need. And Lord, how much how so desperately we need your son. Or how desperately we need the redemption and the remediation of your son and the remembrance of what you've done through him. Lord, as we gather around this table this morning, as we partake of this meal together, Lord, as we take a bite of the bread, as we take a sip of the cup, Lord, help us to remember what we have in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to remember, for those of us who've made that choice, Lord, that choice we made to follow him, to emulate him, and how that choice begins, as, as Kelly put, Lord, with a death, Lord, with surrendering ourself to you, completely and wholly to you, Lord, that our lives might be long to you, Lord, we know that all things have been created through your Son, us included. And Lord, as we partake of this meal, as we think about the reality of the life, death, and resurrection of your Son, Lord, help us to remember that for ourselves. Lord, help that remembrance to sustain us this week. Lord, for all time, that we can rest in the peace of knowing that his life was given for us, and we have eternal life through him. Lord, we thank you for that. And we pray these things in his precious name.
On the night he was to be betrayed, Jesus gathered with his disciples to celebrate the Passover. During the meal, he took the bread, he broke it, and said, This bread is his, my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Later during the meal, he took the cup. He poured it, blessed it, passed it to his disciples and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. pray for our offering. Loving Father, Lord, we live in a, in a world of, of assets and liabilities. Lord, we know that you have created all things and that you created all things through your Son. And so we know, Lord, that you do not introduce debt into our lives. You do not introduce liabilities into our lives. Lord, we do that. And so as we think about what it might mean that everything we have could be an asset, that everything we have in our lives is of value and was given by you, Lord, that, that might change how we regard the world, how we regard each other, how we regard ourselves. Lord, for we are broken. We are struggling with things in our lives. Lord, even the gifts that you've given to us can feel like burdens sometimes, can feel, Lord, can give us anxiety and stress. I think about the preacher worried over the content of the delivery of a sermon, the worship band concerned about their playing and hitting the right notes and getting the right lyrics. Lord, even those families who struggle financially thinking, how can we give when we have so little? Lord, as we think about these things, as we think about the idea of possessions and assets, Lord, help us to see that all these things, Lord, even our anxieties, the things that stress us, Lord, are assets, Lord, and we can think of them in terms of ideas like leverage and investment and things like that, but Lord, help us simply to put them back onto you. Whatever they are, whatever skills that you've given to us, whatever financial resources that you've given to us, whatever, Lord, experiences that we've had in our lives, Lord, help us to reinvest that in you, in your kingdom, Lord, in your church. Help us to give back and to put on you, Lord, everything that we have. Lord, help us to look at our lives and carve out a portion, open up some space, Lord, in faithfulness to you. For we know that you being the God that you are, a God of provision, a God of promise, Lord, that you will fill that space with your grace and your love. So Lord, this morning as we offer a portion of ourselves back to you, whatever that looks like, our time, our skills, our energies, our money, Lord, whatever that is, Lord, bless it as we know only you can. Lord, whatever is taken from us in this moment. Let it be filled, Lord, with faithfulness in you. Lord, let it be filled with, with your grace and your love. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to reflect your love back to you. And we pray that in doing so, people might see you in us. Lord, we thank you and we pray these things in your son's name.
a basket or a hat. Stay tuned. As the kids head downstairs for Children's Church, we're going to be um, turning to the Gospel of John, and we're going we're gonna to kind of enter uh, into an extended study together of the Gospel of John over the next uh, several weeks and months. Um, so we're going to read today from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. You can find this on um, page 750 of your pew Bibles, or you can follow along on the screen. Let's listen to God's word together. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Please pray with me. God, we thank you for your word. The word that we read from each day, each week. But, but even more than that, we thank you for the word made flesh who made his home among us. And, and God, we thank you that in this time we have together, Lord, you, you promise to be among us. You promise to be with us. Lord, through your spirit, you promise to, to guide our, our thoughts and to, to direct our attention and our hearts towards you. And so, God, we pray that, that in these moments we have, you would uh, open our eyes that we might see you and open our, our ears that we might hear you, that we might know more fully who you are and who you've called us to be. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we pray these things. Amen. There's something that you might as well know about me right off the bat. Um, I married into a puzzle family. Now, what this means is that, especially during this time of year, when the weather often forces us to spend more time indoors, it's likely you'll find one or more tables at our house or at my in-law's house with jigsaw puzzles laid out in varying states of completion. Now, this isn't to say that I don't enjoy puzzles. I love lots of different kinds of puzzles. I love word puzzles. I love crosswords, things of that nature. I'm willing to acknowledge that there are few things more satisfying than that feeling of snapping a piece of a jigsaw puzzle in place and watching the array on the table start to look more and more like the picture on the box. It's all the in-between times that I struggle with, the, the long stretches of poring over hundreds of tiny pieces looking for the right one only to be frustrated when it doesn't fit perfectly. And I suppose it's that struggle that makes the final product that much more exciting. As little by little, a picture of a mountain or a clock tower or a city skyline comes into focus. This process always reminds me of of one of my favorite songs in high school. And in this song, the the singer belts out his feelings about that special girl who came into his life and, and changed everything. And he says, she's the puzzle piece behind the couch that makes the sky complete. Now, we might dismiss this lyric as kind of sentimental or maybe overly dramatic. But at its heart, I think what struck me about that lyric when I heard it all those years ago in high school, why it succeeds as a song lyric, is because it expresses in a simple, direct way this feeling that we can all relate to. That moment when some realization or some revelation or maybe some person suddenly helps us to make sense of life, 
to make sense of the world, to make sense of ourselves. Today we're beginning an extended journey through the Gospel of John, and, and, and this is a book that has always been one of my favorites for a lot of reasons. Chief among these reasons is the way that this book reveals Jesus. Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the teacher, Jesus the healer, Jesus the Son of God, Jesus the puzzle piece that brings everything else into focus and makes sense of an otherwise senseless world. Throughout this gospel, as John will lay out for his readers the world-changing words and the life-changing actions of Jesus, we come to know our Lord and Savior in a profound way. And if we let this Jesus whom we encounter in John's gospel root down into our lives, then just like Nathaniel and Nicodemus, just like Mary and Martha, just like Lazarus and Thomas, we will never be the same. And that starts with this passage that we read today, John's prologue. Some people have claimed that this opening passage was a hymn. It was maybe something that the early church recited or sang each week together to remind them of the real identity of the one whom they worshiped. Whatever it is, it's unlike any other passage in scripture because it takes us back. It takes us all the way back to the beginning. In telling the story of Jesus, all of the other gospels start with the birth or maybe the baptism or early ministry of this wandering prophet from Galilee, but not John. John's scope is a little more ambitious and a lot more impressive. He knows that all of these events are important, and he's going to deal with these events in time. But he knows that they aren't the beginning. Just as, as one who had inherited the words of Genesis, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, John wants us to take us back all the way there and show us Jesus. And so today, as, as we begin to explore the life and the work of Jesus, we're going to follow John's lead. We're going to start at the beginning. And when we go to the beginning, we, we don't necessarily find what we would expect. We don't find the, the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and, and lying in a manger. Mangers hadn't been invented yet. Babies hadn't really even been invented yet. We go back to this time when creation, as we know it, everything we see and taste and touch and smell and hear was just an idea in the mind of our creator God. The, in the real beginning, there was the word. And that's where our study of Jesus is going to start. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now at this point, as, as some of the grade school teachers I had growing up would, would tell me, we have to put our thinking caps on, because this is a challenging idea. Normally when we talk about the Word of God, we're, we're talking about Scripture, the Bible, this book that we read from that has actual words, actual sentences in it, stories and lists and instructions. But it's clear from the things that John says about this word of God, the one who was there in the beginning, that there's more to it than that. When John says that the word existed in the beginning, he's, he's not talking about a book or even a collection of books. He's talking about a person, a figure, a being. In some way, he's talking about Jesus. And so if Jesus is the word of God, then like any important word, he's going to tell us things, things about God that we wouldn't know otherwise. Jesus is going to reveal the nature of God in a way that, that ultimately gives us a fuller picture than would otherwise be possible. And today we're going to look at what some of those things are. Some of the ways that this Jesus whom we encounter in John's gospel helps us make sense of God, helps us make sense of the world, and, and helps us make sense of ourselves. So when John uses these three words in the beginning— he knew as well as we do that, that these words also started off the book of Genesis and even the Bible as a whole. Now he wants us to realize that this word, the one he's talking about in his gospel, is a word that tells us, just as we learned in Genesis, it tells us about God's creative power. John wants us to think back to the beginning, to a time when, as Genesis tells us, the earth was formless and void. The Spirit of God hovered over the waters. A time when this world that we now call home was nothing but darkness and emptiness. It's important for John that his readers understand that this person that his book is about, this Jesus, was in some way, in some shape, in some form, present at the creation of the world. When God spoke the heavens and the earth into existence, when, when God sent his words into the world saying, let there be light, 
when God separated the waters and when he hung the stars and when he carved the mountains out of sloppy clay, the sun was there. As long as the one that we call God has existed, God's son has existed. He was not only present at creation, but he was also involved in the act of creation. John expresses this when he says, through him all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. And so the Son, better than anyone else, can show us and tell us just how powerful the God of creation is. In the book of Genesis, we we get a glimpse into this decision-making process where God the Father turns to someone at his side and says, let us make man in our own image. I think we're, we're meant to understand that the Son was present at this conversation. The Son, the Word, helped the Father carry out his purposes in creating the universe. Well, in the Gospel of John, we get the next chapter of the Son's involvement in creation. We get a new revelation of God's power in the signs that, that we're going to be talking about when we read the Gospel of John. As Jesus walked among the sick, as he walked among the hurting and the lost, he recreated their lives with his miraculous hand. And as he did this, he was demonstrating his authority. He was demonstrating his deity. He was demonstrating his rulership over the universe and everything in it. Just as God had shaped people out of the dust, just as God had had conjured up the heavens out of nothingness, Christ's miracles, Christ's ministry will serve to create health out of sickness and hope out of despair. This takes power. It takes the sort of power that was present at creation. And John isn't hiding where that power came from. Jesus had this power. Jesus has this power because he is the son of God. His power is God's power. God the father, the ruler of everything, has always had a partner in his son. One who takes part in the work of creating and of ruling and of sustaining the world around us. It's almost impossible for us to understand fully what this creation partnership and and teamwork might look like. As advanced as as science continues to get, there are still some mysteries of this world we live in that may never be solved. But what, what John tells us is that through all the mystery, through all the darkness, through all the haze, God's son was there, the one who calls us to follow him, the one who claims to know for us the best way for us to live our lives. The king of this kingdom that we are embracing knows what he's talking about because he created us. He continues to create us and recreate us, to shape us in his image. And so the first aspect of the Son of God, the first aspect of the Word of God that that John introduces us to here is his role in creation, his powerful involvement in shaping the universe. Now moving on, we find that just as the Son of God, this Word that John talks about, was the expression of God's power and God's imagination in creation, he is also an expression of God's adoptive love in making us his sons and daughters. In verses 12 and 13, we read that those who received this word, those who recognized this Jesus for who he really was, received the rights to become children of God. And he describes this in language that reminds us of the process of adoption. Any of you who have ever been involved in the process of of adopting a child knows that there are mounds of paperwork, there are hoops to jump through, there are obstacles to overcome before you can finally become parents. But at the end of the day, it's a question of authority. It's it's a commitment made official. It's the power of certain words and certain realities to make the impossible happen. This is what the Son of God is. This is what the Son of God does in verses 12 and 13. His presence, his reality is the authority that overcomes all the obstacles that might exist between us and our Heavenly Father. That overcomes anything that might stand between us and our identity as children of God. And so if God's creative power was displayed through Jesus's miraculous deeds, then God's love is most clearly expressed through what we'll read about near the end of this gospel, Jesus's sacrificial death. When Christ went to the cross, when he took upon his own shoulders the the burden of our unrighteousness and our alienation from God, our sin, he was making it possible for us to be adopted in God's family. His name became a word of authority that even the powers of sin and death and the devil can't overcome. Through him and only through him, we are given the rights to become children of God. 
children born not of natural descent or of human decision or husband's will, but born of God. This is a love that is so powerful that mere human words can't express it. But the word of God can. The word of God did. God has chosen to adopt us. The power of his word, the, the love of his son is what has made this adoption possible. So this word is a word about God's adoptive love. And every action, every teaching, every move that this son of God makes reveals to us the strength of his love. Of course, none more so than his trip to Cal Calvary. Jesus reveals to us the kind of love, the kind of authority that can change us from God's enemies from outsiders in the kingdom of the Father to God's beloved sons and daughters. And finally, the, the word as John sees it is a word that tells us about God's eternal glory. In verse 14, John sums up this idea by saying, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, full of grace and truth. In verse 18, John states that no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. It's clear throughout scripture that there is mystery to God. There is still mystery to God. Throughout the Old Testament, even those who were closest to God were only given glimpses of the glory of the Father because the real thing would have overwhelmed them. Abraham gets lulled into a deep sleep before God enters his presence. Moses can only see God's back when he wants to, to encounter God. Elijah is hidden in a cleft in the mountain where God presents himself as a whisper rather than a roar. These men were only given a taste of the kingdom of heaven because a whole bite would have choked them up. It would have made it impossible for them to, to comprehend anything. Others throughout the Old Testament were so scared of the presence of God that they nearly died if they so much as saw an angel. God's glory was understood to be unapproachable. The reality of God was beyond the grasp of men. But in this word of God, John says, we have something different. We have finally a revelation of the true nature of God in all his glory. In the life of Jesus, and especially in the power of his resurrection, we get this full description of the glory that is God's. And his triumph over death, we experience the weight of heaven. When Jesus went in a period of three days from the dark gloom of the grave to the bright newness of the resurrection life, what we saw was was. God displaying once and for all just what God can do. In Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Word, we have more than just a glimpse of, of God's back or uh, a veiled presence of God. We have the Word, the Son of God, the ruler of the universe, coming to us in a form that we can comprehend. The Word made flesh, God in human form. The same God who created the world and parted the Red Sea and overthrew great armies and nations throughout history, lowered himself to our level. And in doing so, he showed us what real glory is, so that he could reveal to us the glory that can also be ours if we simply trust in him to take us there. God made himself human, not just in a kind of make-believe way, but, but he made himself fully and completely human. He made his home for a while among us for no other reason than to tell us about God, to show us who God really is, and then to invite us to join him in his kingdom. So in these brief 18 verses, what, what John offers us here is the story of Jesus in a nutshell. He's going to spend the next 20 plus chapters unpacking how all of this, God's creative power, God's adoptive love, God's magnificent glory, played out in the life of Jesus Christ. Through the stories he tells, he's going to demonstrate what all of this language is getting at. But the most important thing we should take away from this is that Jesus is the word. Jesus is the one who reveals God most fully because Jesus has always been the word. When he was at the right hand of the father, he was the word. When he lay in a manger, he was the word. When he, he, he touched lepers and when he ate dinner with tax collectors and prostitutes, he was the word. When he prayed in Gethsemane and suffered on the cross, he was the word. When he rose from the grave and ascended to the father, he was the word. Today, when we struggle with questions, and we all struggle with questions, questions about how we should live our lives, how we should raise our children, how we should spend our money, how we should treat our neighbors, Jesus is the word that speaks to us. And so when John tells us that Jesus is the word, he's saying something 
as significant as it is mysterious. He's conveying an idea that is as important to our faith as it might be frustrating to our intelligence. But what he's really saying is that like any powerful word, like any meaningful statement or expression, Jesus reveals something necessary to us. Because he alone is the God who became flesh, the deity who took on human form. He alone is in a position to communicate to us who God is. His life among us, his, his ministry, his miracles, his compassion, his prophetic teaching, all of these show us something of God's creative power, the majesty that was involved in the creation of the world, the ability that God has to recreate us right where we stand. Jesus' death on the cross, as, as gruesome, as painful, as unimaginable as it might be, tells us something about God's adop- adoptive love. It tells us about the avenue open for us that we might become children of God. And finally, Jesus' resurrection, his new life, his position at the right hand of the Heavenly Father. These things tell us about God's eternal glory. They show us that death is not the final word. Sin is not the final word. Our failures are not the final word. The final word is the same as the first word. The one who was present at the beginning saying, let there be light, is the same one who's going to be present at the end in the kingdom of eternal life. The one who was present at creation, the one who who made possible our adoption, will one day watch over our resurrection and will see us from this life into the next. It's the word of God, the son of God, Jesus Christ. Please pray. God, we thank you that this word that we encounter in scripture was present at the beginning. Lord, before all of our struggles, before all of our brokenness, before all of our darkness uh, that, that we bring into the world. You were present with your son Jesus and, and through your spirit, Lord, you were calling into existence all the good things that, that you desire for creation and for us. And God, we thank you that that word continues to speak to us, Lord. It's spoken to your people through generations and, and it has revealed you through generations, and it continues, that word, he continues to reveal you to us now. God, we thank you that when we hear this word, Lord, uh, we, we aren't meant just to forget it, just to, to hear this word and then go on with our lives. We're, we're meant to allow this word to change us and to shape us, as only the most powerful word can. And so, God, we pray that we would hear you with fresh ears, that we would see in your son Jesus, in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, in his mercy, in his grace, in his truth, in the things he said and the things he did, we would see you more fully. We would be drawn into fellowship with you. We would be drawn into uh, into, to, to this uh, adoption as, as your children. And God, we would rejoice in your kingdom, not just now, but, but into all eternity. And Lord, we pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. So we set aside some time each week to respond to the good news. And um, we read the beginning of the Gospel of John today. And over the next several weeks and, and, and several months, we're going to be reading a lot more of what John has to say about this good news uh, that is Jesus, this good news that is the life and the work and the, the, the presence of Jesus in this world and in our lives. And it, it starts with what we read today, that, that through Jesus, all things were made. Through Jesus, God is revealed. Through Jesus, we are called into fellowship with, uh, with this God who loves us. And so we're invited to respond to that. If, if you haven't made the decision to step into this kingdom that, that Jesus holds out, this is a, a time to do that. You can confess his name. You can be baptized into him. And you can begin walking in this newness of life, embracing this, this truth upon truth, this grace upon grace that John talks about that, that God will pour into our lives. It's also a time for, for those of you who have made that decision uh, and, and you want to join a, a community of others who are seeking to, to follow this Jesus together. You can join us here at, at First Christian. And then finally, it's a, it's a time for anyone who just needs prayer. We would love to pray for you. And if, if this is tough to do in front of a group of people, please talk to somebody before you leave. Let us pray for you. Let us pray with you. And uh, let's, let us see what, what God's doing in your life. But now as the worship team sings, let's stand and join them. If you have a decision to make, please come forward.
It's been a joy to get to, to worship with you all today, those of you who are here in the sanctuary and also those of you at home. Um, in a moment, we're going to close in prayer. Before we do, um, just a few announcements. Uh, first of all, um, Wednesday nights, we're, we're back in kind of our, our, our routine, uh, back in the swing of our, of our schedule on Wednesday nights. So at 545, we'll gather in the fellowship hall um, for a meal. Um, if you saw in the bulletin um, that there's a kind of, I guess, a, a notification if you're planning on, on joining us. If, if you know that you are, um, just let us know. I mean, obviously, if, if uh, you don't think you're going to be able to make it and then maybe you decide Wednesday, come. You know, don't, don't, don't say, well, I didn't sign up. I can't come. But it just helps us to get a, a little bit of a, a head count just to kind of know how much food to prepare. If you let us know. If you, if you know you're going to come, just let us know. Don't let that keep you from coming. But, but if, if you do know, um, just, just let us know that you're planning on being there for the meal. Um, and then um, that's followed at 6.30 by um, Action Theater for the Kids, Youth Group, and um, Wednesday Night Discussions for the, for the Youth and Adults. Um, I think next Wednesday, so not this coming Wednesday, but next Wednesday, we're going to be having a community meal. Is that correct? Is that at 6 or 6.30? 6, Six. okay. So, so next Wednesday, things will change a little bit. We'll be having a community meal in the fellowship hall, and that means invite friends, invite family, invite neighbors, invite people you meet on the street, anybody you want who wants to come come for a meal there will uh will it'll be kind of a potluck i think it's italian food is that correct and okay so there's a sign up sheet if you if you want to pitch in and, and help out with the meal please please sign up for that i think we're having karaoke so uh come ready to uh to to, to grace us all with with uh with with uh, the gift of song, um, and we'll be we'll be enjoying that time together. So that's going to be not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday. And so we won't have our um, a lot of kind of our normal Wednesday night activities because the community meal will just be a time for us to to be together and again invite invite neighbors, invite friends and, and family. Especially, you know, one of the reasons we've 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 worked so hard and well, others have worked so hard. I've 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 watched as others have worked hard uh, on on making that space what it is is because we really want it to be a hospitable place to to invite friends and and, and guests and neighbors to to come and, and spend time with us. So that's really what what those meals are for. So so please um, come to that and and pitch in however you can and and, and invite whomever you can. Um, Next Sunday, uh, next Sunday evening at six o'clock, everyone is invited to our house for a Super Bowl party. 
Um, as I said last week, even if you don't care about football, if you don't care about watching the game, we will have the game on, I promise. But um, just come and enjoy some, some good food and some, some good company with, with, uh, with friends from church. So um, that's going to be at 6 o'clock at our house um, next Sunday. Uh, just please bring your favorite, you know, your favorite game time snack or, you know, dessert or whatever you want to bring just to, uh, just to share. And, um, it's always a fun time just to get to spend some time together again, whether you care about football or not, it's a fun, fun excuse to get together and, and enjoy the, enjoy the evening. So that's going to be next Sunday, six o'clock at our house. If you have questions about that, let me know. Um, and, um, I'll definitely point you in the right direction. Um, any other announcements? Okay. Okay. So there's a there's a ladies meeting in the fellowship hall. I'm assuming. Okay. Um, and I think you all are having lunch, some some food. Uh, so any any uh, ladies of the church who who want to get together for for lunch and 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 uh, fellowship together right after church, you're you're welcome to go. Ellie. Okay. So there's a there's a youth event at Doe River Gorge on Tuesday. If you have questions about that, ask Ella. Six thirty, free Chick Fil A, Doe River Gorge. Ella can't be there, but a lot of a lot of other wonderful people will be there. So, but 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 she'll she'll point you in the right direction. Any other announcements? All right. Well, let's close in prayer. God, we thank you once again for the chance to come together and spend some time together in fellowship, in worship, in prayer, gathering around your table and. and embracing the, the life that you hold out for us. God, we pray that as we, as we leave this place, Lord, we would, we would go as those who have, been, uh, who have heard the good news of your son and who want to share it with others in the things we do, the things we say, that, that, Lord, your love and your grace might pour out of us, that we might be faithful ministers and messengers of your kingdom. Send us out in, in your strength and your power um, that we might, uh, we might worship you in all that we do. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, and by the power of your Holy Spirit that we pray all of these things. Amen. Go in peace.